Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp, and today we're taking a look at what is the largest bayonet I have ever examined. It's so big, I cannot get it all in frame. So this is the Ottoman of uh, model 1874 NCO sword, bay L sword bayonet, and um, absolutely huge. And it's made for the 11.4 uh, millimeter model of 1874 Peabody Martini rifle, uh, as well as the later conversion of that rifle to 7.65 uh, millimeter. Now, this rifle was essentially just a copy of the Martini Henry. I believe they were just like um, licensing issues around manufacturing it or something like that. But for all intents and purposes, it's the exact same rifle, just uh, manufactured in the US by a different manufacturer. So they're actually made by the rifles, that is, they were made by the Providence Tool Company. But these sword bayonets here, their construction was sub subcontracted out to the Ames Manufacturing Company of Chicopee Falls, Massachusetts. Now, 200,000 of these bayonets were made uh, from 1875 onwards. It's not clear the exact years of production. So we'll jump into the history very quickly. We'll just take a very quick look at it. And actually, so obviously, Yadigan style of blade, uh, absolutely huge, very heavy, too. And while they were, well, they're called NCO bayonets, I don't know if they were only issued to NCOs because they had what seven, eight hundred thousand rifles total with 200,000 of these ordered, so that's a lot more than there would have been NCOs. So, I don't know exactly who they were issued to. But jumping into the history, in uh, 1870 through to 1872, uh, the Ottomans were really after a um, breech-loading rifle. So particularly after the uh, American Civil War, they had seen what, um, well, the world had seen what breech-loaders could be capable of, and they wanted to get some. Now, the Ottomans were, they were buying all of the Enfield muskets and rifles they could get their hands on at the time because they had huge uh, shortage. In, um, well, this is a, a bit of a, long story i'm going to really condense it down and simplify it um a thighs from cnr arsenal really went into depth and spent an hour and a half elaborating on it uh, for the purposes of this video we'll keep it nice and simple so in 1872 they had trials for a, a new breech loading rifle um and they ended up choosing none of them uh 50 000 martini henry rifles were given to the ottoman empire by egypt i don't know if they were sold or how they procured them but they did and it was determined that that was the rifle that they wanted. And um, I can't remember where I read it. I read it ages ago somewhere that the British wouldn't uh, give them to the Ottomans or wouldn't sell to them. So they had to procure a different version of that rifle. And um, that's why they went to the Providence Tool Company in the US to manufacture the Peabody Martini uh, rifle and bayonets. And um, for all intents and purposes, the rifles are the same. The bayonets are a little bit different. So the rifle is made to take a socket bayonet primarily. Uh, I don't have that socket bayonet to show you. And a small number or a smaller number were to take this ginormous sword bayonet. And it's extremely heavy. Not only is it the longest bayonet, but by miles, the heaviest. Just the handle is incredibly, incredibly heavy. I mean, the other large bayonets of the day that I have to compare it to, like the Chaspo, the, the Swiss Vedely, um, all those others, uh, the, the Austrian Vendel, well, they might be quite long. They're not nearly this long. And just the handles in particular, it's so incredibly heavy. So 600,000 uh, rifles were ordered from the Providence Tool Company initially. Uh, from memory, they were different months within the same year or different year orders, I can't remember, but the first order was like 200, the second was three, the third was like 100,000, I can't really remember. Not particularly relevant to this bayonet, but the Ottomans were having a huge problem um, meeting their payments and um, they would fall behind. The Providence uh, Tool Company would withhold the rifles or a number of them until payment was made and they'd organize new payment plan, they'd make the first payment, they would deliver the rifles, and then they would immediately default. And this went on and on and on and on. And I can only imagine how much the Providence Tool Company were pulling their heads, uh, pulling their hair out 
over this deal because it was just an absolute nightmare. Um, eventually, a large number of the, the rifles, and I believe quite a number of the bayonets too, uh, unclear how many, were retained and um, on sold to cover the costs of the Ottomans just essentially screwing them around, which was surprising because they were a very, very well-off empire, but they had a couple of wars on, a bit of unrest and a bit going on, apparently. Now, as I said, 200,000 of these sword bayonets were manufactured, but not nearly that many were delivered to the Ottomans. So a number were retained in the US and directly sold to the surplus market there. And generally, those ones will be completely unmarked. Uh, these ones do have um, Ottoman serial numbers on them, but that's really about the only marking other than an inspection mark you will find on these, but I'll get into that later. And um, interestingly enough, one of the ships that was carrying the rifles and these sword bayonets, 42,000 of these sword bayonets, actually sunk as it was leaving the US. And um, I can't remember if it was sunk by someone or if it was scuttled or I can't remember the exact details, but it went down, but not terribly deep. And uh, the rifles and bayonets were eventually able to be uh, recovered. However, the rifles had to be reconditioned or remade. And um, it's unclear what the 42,000 sword bayonets, uh, what happened to them, whether they were scrapped and remade, whether they were reconditioned. I mean, that that's one in five of the bayonets made total. So, you know, there's potential this one here very well could have been one of those and you just wouldn't know. Maybe they're in reasonably good condition, just refinished, regripped. I don't know, but um, interesting little bit of trivia. Now, these bayonets saw extensive use, uh, particularly in the Russo-Turkish War. And uh, as I said, many of them remained in the US uh, because they just weren't sold to the Ottomans. Um, this one here is the full length, and you can tell that because the fuller terminates and you've still got a good amount of length there, like six inches or more from the fuller to the tip of the blade. But... Um, a lot of them were actually shortened, probably to a point just here beyond the fuller, and even partially straightened and had the scabbard shortened as well. Uh, they're pretty common to find shortened. Uh, I've been told it's harder to find the full length versions. However, the only two I've ever come across have been the full length versions, so I don't know. Now, these bayonets were eventually replaced. So in 1887, uh, the Ottomans replaced their single shot breech loading rifle, the Peabody Martini, uh, with the model of 1887 Mauser, which was a Kropatschek style of black powder rifle with a tubular magazine. Um, bad year to purchase a black powder rifle, 1887. As we all know, 1886 was the um, introduction of the smokeless powder. So in uh, 1890, those rifles were pretty much immediately replaced with the model of 1890, which was um, like your more standard Mauser style uh, internal box magazine, smokeless powder. Uh, interestingly enough, this bayonet here doesn't belong to me. It belongs to a good friend. And um, his background, well, he, his, yeah, he comes from uh, a country that was formerly a part of the Ottoman Empire. And um, interesting little bit of trivia, one of his uh, relatives, I don't know exactly what it was, like a great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather or something like that, was actually beheaded with um, one of these bayonets. I asked him for a couple of details, but he didn't have them on hand, so he might get back to me later and I'll chuck them down in the comments section below. But um, yeah, they're not just um, for show, they're not just for NCOs, they're not just status symbols, they were actually used. And um, when the model of 1890 uh, rifles and all the mouse style rifles started coming in, a lot of these were retained as uh, swords. So they had the locking mechanism and mortise here filled in or removed. And quite often as well, you'll find these with a uh, chrome or nickel finish in a bright like ceremonial style of uh, configuration. Now we might jump into the construction. As I previously stated, we have a Yatagan style of blade, which is a blade with two curves in it being here and here. And that brings the point away from the muzzle of the firearm. Um, if you haven't seen my history video on Yatagan blades, essentially uh, it increases the cutting coefficient of the blade and it's based on the old Yatagan swords of the Ottoman Empire. 
And it was really brought into the mainstream for bayonets by the French with the model of 1842 and then the Chasseau. And for quite a few years, it was all the rage. Um, practically, it also brings the point of the bayonet away from uh, the muzzle. So when you're using a ramrod to um, load a muzzle loader, not that this was a muzzle loader, it was a breech loading firearm. Uh, it's just a bit safer so you don't stab your hand. But then um, looking at the actual blade, uh, it's in the white, got nice big squared fullers on either side and a nice big flat spine. Uh, this blade is not sharpened at all and the point is quite dull. But um, I imagine if something like this was used to behead someone, they would have been quite sharp. And I've been told that these older style of bayonets, um, I can't speak for the American ones, but certainly the German and the French, they hold an edge quite well. You'd think um, steel back then was rubbish, but apparently not. Then we have a uh, muzzle ring, which is really close down to the guard and a nice big hook quill end with a ball finale on the end. Uh, the grips are leather, they're not composite, and they've held up quite well. I've got a little bit of damage down the base here, but overall, very, very nice. And they're retained to the, um, the tang by five rivets, as you can see. Then we have a nice big uh, eagle head style of pommel with a very small push button. And on the other side here, you'll see we just have a leaf spring, and that is quite tight. It's got a little bit of delay when it closes again, so there might be a bit of grease or cosmoline or something in there causing that. And then we just have a T style of mortise, so there's no um, concession for a cleaning rod. The cleaning rod would have been stored elsewhere on the rifle. Now, I'm not certain where they would have fixed to the rifle if they were fitted to the right hand side like many of the larger Yadagun style of bayonets were or if they were under the barrel or to the left, I, I don't know. But I'm guessing it's most likely to the right. Um, I'll have another look while I'm editing but to date I still haven't found an answer to that question. Then moving down to the scabbard, it's actually quite difficult to find these with the original scabbards. The Turks did not look after their gear very very well and particularly leather in Turkish service just did not hold up so quite lucky to have this one here. Um, we just have a uh, steel locket with a very small frog stud circular. The mouth will only accommodate the bayonet in one way as you can see and then we just have our leather body stitched down the back. No markings on it at all and then we have our chape down the bottom but um, quite well made, with little staples retaining it. And um, finally, I'll jump into the markings. So as I alluded to earlier, there are only two markings you will come across on these. The first is an inspection marking here on the Ricasso, on the right Ricasso, and that's a B. And my understanding is that was put there uh, in factory so that's not something that was done by um, the Ottomans upon receipt of the bayonet. And the other marking is a serial number here on the right cross guard in Ottoman Turk. So a lot of people will try to tell you it's Arabic or something like that, but these early markings uh, that you find on Ottoman uh, gear is always in Ottoman Turk. And um, those are the only like deliberate markings I found. I have found one or two small like manufacturing process markings like got a little C here on the tang but I believe that's a part of the manufacturing process. That's not a quality inspection mark or proof mark or anything like that. And then we have no markings whatsoever on the scabbard which is quite disappointing because um, later uh, Ottoman bayonets and rifles are just absolutely covered with uh, little proof marks and inspection marks and they have them um, they're like little uh, totems of good luck essentially uh, the Ottoman Empire was a very superstitious place and uh, people used to carry talismans of luck so you'd find proof marks and inspection marks and they would be religious symbology that would bring luck to the soldier like uh, the crescent moon or the seal of Solomon or something like that but none of that whatsoever on this which is a little bit disappointing 
Now, this is a very, very nice bayonet. I'm quite jealous of my mate. I know he's incredibly happy to have it. And I um, wouldn't mind getting my hands on one of the shortened ones, actually. It'd go well with my um, shortened uh, Vendor bayonet, which I'm very fond of. Anyway, guys, that's all I have to say about this bayonet. Um, if you've enjoyed the video, please uh, like it and uh, maybe subscribe to the channel. It really helps with the uh, the algorithm and uh, definitely boosts my motivation when I get engagement to um, keep making videos. But um, plenty more to come. Um, as I said, subscribe. I've got another 20 or 30 bayonets still to film and then I've got to get back into the, um, the groove of sourcing more. Um, I might do a video in the coming weeks actually of uh, how to avoid scammers because they seem to be really, really prolific on the um, the buy and sell sites online at the moment. They're absolutely shocking. I went through one site today and the last 10 posts were all scammers. It's horrible. Anyway, that's all I have to say um, today about this bayonet. And um, if you have any further information or I've made any mistakes, please comment below, correct me, um, educate all of us. I'm sure we'd love to read what you have to say. Thanks for watching.